Welcome to Medscape. I'm Dr. Andrew Wilner, reporting virtually from the American Academy of Neurology meeting. I'm here today with Dr. David Dodick to speak about his presentation regarding a new migraine treatment. Dr. Dodick is a professor emeritus of neurology from the Mayo Clinic and current chair of the Atria Academy of Science and Medicine. I had the pleasure of passing Dr. Dodick in the hall a few years ago when I worked at the Mayo Clinic as a locum tenens neurologist. Dr. Dodick, it's a pleasure to see you again. It's great to see you, Dr. Wilner. Thank you for, um, thank you for having me. Well, I'm pretty excited to learn, you know, I, I called the abstract, you know, to find an interesting one and somehow yours popped up because it concerns uh, these CGRP inhibitors that I'm reading more and more about. So, so tell us about your abstract and, and what you did. Sure, Dr. Wilner. So what we did here, the abstract t- title is Mean Monthly Migraine Days, Acute Medication Use Days, and migraine specific quality of life in individuals who were enrolled in an atojapan prevention trial. And we did a post hoc analysis. So just by way of background, when we look at prevention trials in migraine, the primary endpoint is generally a reduction in mean monthly migraine days. So comparing baseline one month before starting treatment, patients are usually on treatment for three, maybe six months, And then we look at the mean monthly reduction in migraine days during whatever primary endpoint time period we've identified compared to baseline. In this particular case, we're looking at weeks nine through 12. So the third month compared to the baseline month. In addition to that, in prevention trials, we also look at the responder rate. So the proportion of patients who have at least a 50% reduction in mean monthly migraine days. So mean monthly migraine day reduction is the primary endpoint. Secondary endpoint is usually responder rate. Here, what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at the responders and the non-responders and get a little more granular to identify the magnitude of the response in those who do respond and the magnitude of the non-response in those who didn't respond. So this was a typical prevention trial with a atojapent, which is an oral CGRP receptor antagonist. So it's a small molecule different than the CGRP monoclonal antibodies, which are biologics that are injected once a month or once every three months. Patients here had episodic migraine, so four to 14 migraine headache days per month to be enrolled. And again, the, the, they had to have a history of migraine for at least a year and we're looking at months, weeks nine through 12. Now, the actual primary endpoint in this trial was the overall three month reduction. So what was the mean monthly reduction over the 90 days over the three months during the trial? What we're doing here is we're looking at that third month because you know, when we start a preventive treatment, we know that there's a cumulative benefit over time. Patients look better at month three than they do at month two than they did at month one. And most prevention trials actually do look at that third month. So I wanted to take a look at that third month and look at the magnitude of the response in those who actually responded. And what we found was that 71% of people on 60 milligrams of atojapant achieved a greater than 50% reduction in mean monthly migraine days during that third month. That's quite, quite a substantial responder rate. Typically, when we look at other oral preventive treatments, Uh, we're looking at somewhere between 45 and 55% um, who respond have a greater than 50% reduction at weeks nine through 12. Now, I know I'm comparing across trials, but I'm just trying to put this in a bit of context here. So in those who responded to treatment, their mean monthly migraine days went from 7.7 days of migraine at baseline per month down to 0.6 at weeks nine through 12. So 7.7 to 0.6. That's a substantial difference. We also well, looked at, sorry, go ahead. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I was curious if there was any requirement to get into the trial that you had already tried other preventative medicines or um, that, uh, you know, and they didn't work or did work, or could they be on other medications that were they on other preventive medicines? And this was an add-on trial, or these were patients who were not taking anything else? Yeah, so it's a good question. Typically in these trials, 
we tend to exclude people who are treatment failures, if you will. So those people who have failed more than two previous preventive treatments. And while it varies from trial to trial, whether patients can be on a preventive medication, in this trial, patients could be on a preventive medication so long as that medication was stable and hadn't had a recent change in the dose. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay. It's a little different than epilepsy trials where you have to fail two medicines to get in. Yeah. Uh, in your case, it's the opposite. Okay, well, that, that's very interesting. Yeah, in this particular case, and in most migraine trials, actually, you can be treatment naive. You can never have had a prior preventive medication, or you could have failed up to two. Um, it's just, it's interesting when we look at some of the biologic prevention studies, those who have failed two to four medications, um, the separation from placebo is even greater. So the, the more medications someone has failed, the greater the effect size, if you will, because I guess expectation of a patient who's already failed three or four medications is going to be lower. So the placebo response is lower. Now the magnitude of the response in most prevention trials, as you fail more medicines, the magnitude of the response may be somewhat attenuated or blunted but the effect size or the ability to separate from placebo is actually greater. Are there any other oral CGRP uh, antagonists like this drug? There is. There's a, a drug called remegipant. And remegipant actually is the only oral CGRP receptor antagonist that is appro approved both for the acute treatment of migraine at 75 milligrams and the preventive treatment of migraine at 75 milligrams taken every other day. So there's two oral CGRP receptor antagonists, one used every day and one used every other day. And uh, I don't know if uh, there's enough data, if it's fair to ask you the answer, but the ones I've been reading about are mostly injectable and now there's an oral. Would there be any reason to take an injectable if there's an oral? Uh, well, usually it's a, it's a personal reason, and sometimes there may be a medical reason. So as I said earlier, the injectable CGRP antagonists are monoclonal antibodies. They're large 150 kilodalton molecules. Um, they're peptides, so you really can't take them orally. They're A, too large, and B, they'd be, they, they'd be metabolized by peptidases and enzymes in the stomach, so they have to be injected. They have a long half-life. So on average, the half-life is about 28 days or a month. That's why they're usually injected subcutaneously once a month. So the benefit of having an antibody is that you don't have to take a pill every day or a pill every other day. You take an injection once a month, or with some of these antibodies, you can take an infusion, IV infusion, once every three months. And one of the subcutaneous antibodies you can take, um, you can take subcutaneously every three months at a higher dosage. So it's ease of use, perhaps. You don't have to take a pill every day or every other day. Um, the downside, of course, is that it does have a long half-life. So let's say you're a, a young woman of childbearing age and you plan to have a family. You have to be off of a drug, as you know, it, for at least five half-lives before uh, you become pregnant or become, before you conceive. So if you're planning a pregnancy or you're planning conception, and you're on an antibody, you have to be off that antibody for five months before you try to conceive. With these small molecules, of course, um, they're, much, they're, they're small molecules. They can be taken orally. They're not peptides. They're drugs. And um, the half-life is somewhere between six and 12 hours. So you can see if you needed to stop the medicine, the medicine's out of your, uh, out of your system, so to speak, in a much shorter period of time, within a week, certainly. Now, as a clinical neurologist myself, who is not a headache specialist, I still treat many patients in my clinic with migraine. Yes. And there's lots of different classes of prophylactic medications. And, um, you know, you look for reasons to try this one, like topiramate for weight loss or, you know, beta blocker if they have hypertension should now, where does this new class fit in? Is it at the top of the list, the bottom of the list? I mean, obviously we're going to individualize, but where, how should I visualize this? It's a great question. My answer to that question is the decision has been somewhat taken out of your hands because 
you can only, if you're individualizing treatment and you felt for whatever reason that a Tojapant or Mejapant or one of the monoclonal antibodies should be first choice for that patient, it just so happens that it can't be first choice because insurance carriers will not reimburse or cover the medicine, one of these new medicines, unless a patient has failed at least two prior preventive medications in the United States today. So if, you, if, a, patient, if a, a patient who's naive to preventive treatment comes into your office and has disabling migraine, and let's say they have eight, eight migraine days per month, clearly an indication for prevention. You must try one of the older oral preventive medications, or you could try a device or non-pharmacotherapy. But if you want to start a drug therapy, you really can't start an antibody or one of these new CGRP receptor antagonists until they failed at least two. Once they fail two, then if you, if you feel, for example, that uh, the patient is a good candidate for one of these CGRP antagonists, then by all means. Okay, so there's a uh, roadblock that's not medical. I guess Correct. we'll just leave it at that for now. I mean, what I'd like to ask you is that if the, all the medications were free, <laughs> would you have any preference as to where to start? Well, let me answer that by saying, do I think there's a role for the older preventive medicines in people for prevention? And the answer to that is yes. And you alluded to some of the reasons why I might start an oral preventive in a patient who needs weight loss, for example, um, who might have epilepsy, for example. Um, Topiramate might maybe a very reasonable choice. For someone who needs to sleep better or um, is actually you know, has a very lean body mass index who may have a bit of depression, then perhaps a tricyclic uh, may be indicated in that patient. Having said that, you know, who, which, who, what, what mental health expert actually starts a tricyclic as first line therapy for depression? So the problem with some of these medicines are that the adverse events in people with migraine occur at much lower dosages. So the dosage that it a patient with epilepsy might experience adverse events with tapiramate may be very different than migraine. So sometimes we can't get, you try to get a twofer, right? You try to start a medicine because of its antidepressant effect. You start it, but you can't get them up beyond 25 milligrams, 30 milligrams. And that's simply not enough to have an antidepressant effect. So um, my, my, my inclination is to try to optimize the treatment of the disease that you're treating and if you, if you feel comfortable, optimize the treatment of, of the other comorbidities with different medicines or in, with different lifestyle or behavioral modifications. But let me come back to your question. Do I think there's a role if money were taken off the table, if cost was not an issue, where I would start a CGRP monoclonal antibody or a CGRP receptor antagonist first line? Absolutely. Without doubt, 100%. And the reason I say that is we have enough experience, long-term experience. Now we have almost, we have actually, we have over six year long-term data now on one of these antibodies. And we've got long enough data with these oral CGRP receptor antagonists, enough of a sample size to know that what the adverse event profile is of blocking CGRP. Um, so at least I feel confident. And, and I also feel confident that if you're starting a patient, especially with chronic migraine on a preventive medicine, let's say one of the older drugs, we know that 80% of patients discontinue that drug by 12 months, right? So eight times out of 10, they're off the drug. They can't be on it long-term. Why? Because it either didn't work or too many adverse events. So the benefit of these new drugs is that while the efficacy is comparable by and large, the adverse event profile is more favorable. So the number needed to treat and the number, number needed to treat may be similar, but the number needed to, to harm is much different. And therefore the, the likelihood of being helped or harmed or the benefit to risk ratio favors these drugs because patients are able to tolerate them and stay on them. So, you know, I've had patients who have been on um, the first antibody when it was first approved who are still on the antibody um, because there are no side effects and they're obviously responding very well. I, would, I should say one more thing. For people who have, are on a lot of medicines, who have polypharmacy, if you will, the monoclonal antibodies may be attractive. Why? Because they're proteins, they're peptides. They're not metabolized by the liver or excreted in the kidneys, so they don't interact with other drugs. So you don't have to worry about drug-drug interactions. 
if someone has a lot of comorbidities and they're on a lot of medicines. Not true with oral drugs, of course. Um, so those are some of the reasons why if cost were no issue, I would definitely be starting some of these newer medicines in selected patients. Dr. Doak, that, that was great. That's exactly what uh, I wanted to learn. Is there anything you'd like to add before we conclude? These new medicines have legitimized this disease and legitimized the patients who suffer from this disease. And why I say that is because when you can develop a biologic that targets a molecule, a peptide or its receptor, you understand the biology of that disease pretty well. That disease now has biological underpinnings and a molecular biology that's understood. So it gives the disease and those who suffer, I think, legitimacy. Um, and also, it's exciting to be able for the first time have a preventive treatment that actually targets the biology of the disease and not take hand-me-down med medicines from other diseases that have been developed for other diseases. Yes, they're shown to be effective, um, but it's, it's finally satisfying to be able to say to a patient, I'm going to give you this acute medicine and this preventive medicine that was specifically developed to treat migraine and only approved to treat migraine. That's, that's a day, having done this for 32 years now, I'm aging myself, but having done this for over three decades, I'm finally at a stage where I have disease-specific therapy uh, that targets the biology of the illness. And that's a good, that's a, that's a great day. And the, the nice thing is that the pipeline is rich. We understand this disease. CGRP is not everything because there are people who clearly don't respond. And there are clearly other factors, other neuropeptides, other neurotransmitters. Fortunately, we have a very clear understanding now of what those are, what those targets are. And new therapies are now being developed to, uh, to go after those targets. Dr. Dodick, I want to thank you for this uh, very informative discussion. My pleasure, Dr. Wilner. Good to see you again. I'm Dr. Andrew Wilner, reporting for Medscape. <music>